series, if you will, on I Love My Church. We have uh, been struggling through this for a number of weeks now, and, and I kind of wanted to wrap it up with the ministry opportunities in my church. I love my church because my church gives me opportunities to carry out God's purpose and plan for me. And I'm not only talking about me, I'm talking about all of us together. Amen. If you were uh, in our Sunday evening service last week, we began a study on the, the little book by Tom Rainer entitled, I Am a Church Member. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have a chance to come out on Sunday night, uh, we'll be looking at the second chapter of that book, and uh, I'll be preaching a message based upon that second chapter. Uh, a tremendous little study on our obligations and responsibilities um, as church members and having the attitude that makes a difference. You know, oftentimes we come into church with attitudes. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. You know, it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, but I, I want you to know that God has called us to be different in our attitude, to be different in, our, in, in how we portray ourselves, not only uh, trying to be something that we're not, but may our attitude truly be who we are. So I would encourage you uh, this evening, 6 o'clock, to join us if you have the opportunity, and we'll continue in that little study. Looking though at, uh, I love my church. Do you love your church? Amen. 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 You know, as I was thinking about this uh, this past week, and it was a very busy week, uh, Rolando and I had a pastor's uh, symposium up in McAllen that was live streamed down from uh, South Texas School of Christian Studies in, in Corpus. And uh, we had a tremendous time all day Thursday there with other pastors throughout the valley, uh, coupling live stream with pastors from the Corpus area, and, uh, and studying uh, prophetic preaching in the, in the church today. And prophetic preaching is basically preaching to the culture. And a uh, tremendous time that we had there listening to ministers and pastors and uh, from, from Baptist churches and other denominations scattered around our area. And a uh, very, very filling time. But, of course, it, it made me have to crunch my time this week. Uh, I try to put study of the Word into, or study of sermons into every day of my week, at least Monday through Thursday. And so anyway, my time was crunched this week, but as I was sitting there this week studying and, and praying and considering this, this topic today, you know, I, I thought about the fact that our society is filled with avid sports fans. How many sports fans do we have here? And okay, about, about a, a quarter of you will actually admit to it. And because uh, you don't know where I'm going with that, it scares you. I better not say anything here. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to call you out on it. But as such, the majority of avid sports fans enjoy watching their sport from their recliner. Amen. <laughs> Brother E.B. E. fits the profile. <laughs> and thus, what we have in our society is probably more avid armchair sports fans. You know, these individuals, they enjoy their favorite sport from the sideline. As the paid professionals duke it out in whatever that, uh, the fashion of that sport requires. Sadly, the church has adopted the same mentality among its members. At some point in time, the, the ministry roles within the church got swapped around. And I'm talking about uh, after the, the New Testament church that we read about in the book of Acts, moving forward a few hundred years, things began to get out of whack, if you will. The church got swapped around and actually became unscriptural 
as the membership determined to relegate all ministry work over to the paid professionals or the church staff. In essence, what happened is the church became a spectator sport, an armchair sport. I made the comment, uh, just jokingly, to Rolando this week, uh, where we were at up in McAllen, they had chairs similar to these, but they didn't have arms on them, they, thus you could get more in. I told Rolando we need to get us a hacksaw and go around and cut the arms off of those chairs and we could get more, uh, more chairs in here. <laughs> I thought he was going to die. <laughs> he knew what would happen. <laughs> It was a good joke for the day, though. Anyway, moving forward, it became the express duty of the pastor and the staff to carry out all the work of the church with the membership adopting this sideline mentality. Watching, listening, and always expecting something new, something fresh, you know, something from the servants that we've got up here serving us. And the fact is, this mentality played itself out for quite a long time, nearly two centuries. What happened is, in and through all of this, and what happens in this type of mentality is, the people in the pew are missing out on the blessings of the ministry. <laughs> Certainly, those of us that are ministers... And our ministering, we, we, we reap the blessing, if you will, of seeing lives changed, of seeing people transformed, of seeing people growing in their, in their faith, in their knowledge, in their understanding of the Lord. While the people in the pew are simply watching what's going on. Long-term effect was the church fail to be as effective in reaching people as God had intended for her to do. Because one or two people were attempting to do the work that God had determined for the mass of the congregation to be carrying out. Myself or myself and Rolando, we can only carry out so much uh, ministry work during the week. We can only interact with so many individuals during the week. But if you multiply that across the congregation and the number of friends and family members that the congregation has and other individuals that they come into contact with every day, you multiply that across the congregation, you see the great difference between Rolando and I reaching a small handful Whereas the congregation can reach a great armful. We have a world where in, I read just recently, 2.7 billion people have never even heard anything to do with Jesus Christ in their entire life. 2.7 billion people. You multiply that over or add that over, however you want to do it. My math isn't that great, so however you get to that fact. Pretty much three quarters or more of the world population do not know Jesus Christ in a fashion well enough to have a relationship with Him. And yet we get comfortable in our surroundings. We get comfortable in our setting where we're sitting here in a, in a community of unsaved, unchurched people. That's the fact, folks. Look around. Realize very quickly, I can, we're, the, we're the biggest uh, church in this community. We have the largest seating capacity in this community. And if you look around and then you, you add in the other three churches that are in this community, you find out that a vast number of individuals in our community are unchurched. Meaning they are not in church today. They really don't have a home church, if you will. Now certainly, if you go door to door here, as we did recently, you find out that the vast majority of individuals in this community will tell you that 
they go to the Catholic Church. Well, I don't know if you've seen the Catholic Church over there, but it is smaller than our chapel over here. So I can guarantee you that all the people in this community don't go over to the Catholic Church on a regular basis. Fact is, probably, if you really could pin these individuals down, you would find out that they are Catholic in name only, meaning that their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents at one time or another went to a Catholic church, and they have carried that over. But we have people who are Baptist in name only. We have people who are Assembly of God in name only, who are community church in name only. And we've got a lot of individuals around us that are absolutely nothing in name only. But we're real content to be right where we are. I'm not content, folks. It breaks my heart to think of the number of unsaved people in our, in our reach. When I talk about our reach, I talk about outside of this city, this community. I talk about the reach that God has planned for us to reach out and to impact. We don't know how far that is. We know that every week, probably seven or 800 people watch the video that we make here of the preaching. That is around the world. I want to multiply that over a great many times. Because a great number of people are not entering the church today, but they are watching one way or another through the internet. Folks, whatever it takes to reach people, we've got to be determined to reach people. And if we can reach seven or eight hundred a week simply with a little video camera, think what we could reach if, if, we, if we did a little more to it. Put a little more into it. Let's continue on. I want us to take a look at Ephesians 4. Because I want to see what Jesus has to say about this. It's not about what I've got to say today. It's about what Jesus has to say today. Amen. That's what matters today. What does Jesus say about all of this? Paul tells us this in Ephesians 4, verse 7. He says, Now the grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. Skipping down to verse 11 now through 13. And he personally, who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Now he says until we all reach unity in the faith. Well, I've already told you that the vast number of people in our community alone are not unified in the faith. Therefore, we got a big, uh, we got a, we got a lot to do ahead of us. We got a lot of work ahead of us. The design of Jesus Christ for His church is that every member be involved in the ministry work. From that, we can determine that. If you really love your church, if you love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we are a part of that body, the scripture is telling us that you are going to be an active participant in the work of your church. Let's begin this morning by considering that God has granted specific giftings for everyone. Now, I want you to understand something while you're sitting here today. God has granted every individual within the church with specific giftings. You may not know what your gifting is, but I can guarantee you, because I just read it in the Word, you've got some gifting within you. Are you exercising that gift? Are you using that gift? Are you, are you pursuing after the fulfillment of what God has placed within you to use for the building up of His church? 
The main function of the church is to make disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Very straightforward. Go and make disciples. Now the church has done a fairly good job of going. Why? Because we have put some money in the offering plate and we know that a percentage of that will go out to missions and so somebody's going and so we can feel satisfied in that. We shouldn't, but we do. He said, go, and, but then he said something else, make disciples, make followers, make other believers and build them up, mature them in the faith. That's where the church has failed so much for many, many years. We have failed to educate and train and build up individuals in the faith so that they can turn around and do it again and it can continue on. We simply believe that it's the pastor's role to take care of this, feed us a little bit each week, we're going to be satisfied, we're going to go home and we'll come back next week and we'll get another little dose. Now if that was your eating habit, where every Sunday you ate just a little dose, after a while, you would wither up and fade away. Some faster than others. But the fact is, we cannot survive on just a little feeding once every Sunday morning. But rather, we need to drench ourselves into the Word of God. We need to pour it into our inmost being. We can do that through our own personal Bible study. We can do it through other Bible studies. We can get together with other individuals. We can join a Sunday school group. We can join a small group. We can come to church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And all of these things help to feed us and to build us up and to grow us and mature us as Paul is talking about here in our text passage. But sadly, because we live in a hurry, hurry world, uh, the busyness of life has taken most of our feeding time away. And we are no longer getting the nutrition that we need from the Word of God because we simply don't have time. We don't get the fellowship that God calls for us. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. You need that fellowship time. We need that fellowship time. We need to encourage one another. We need to build up one another in the faith. And we do that by utilizing our various giftings that God has given us and sharing those things with one another. Look at verse 7 again. He says, Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. What this verse is telling us that it, is that every member of the body of Christ has been uniquely gifted by God's grace. These giftings, folks, listen, are not based upon any individual's worth or merit, but the Bible tells us they're solely upon the discretion of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of His church. And each of these have a purpose, and they are to complete the body, to bring completeness within the body. These giftings are not granted for the individual's own personal benefit, but rather that we may all be beneficial to one another and to the body as a whole. Verse 12 says, For the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. It is important to note that Jesus bestows specific leadership giftings. He has these specific giftings. And those leadership giftings, he mentions there in verse 11, he says there are the prophet, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. 
These individuals have a special gifting, a special calling from God to serve the church in leadership capacity. But what we have to keep in mind is these individuals utilize their calling in order to enrich the church who is then called to carry out their giftings and their callings and to fulfill the ministry work of the church. Secondly, now, as we move on, I, I previously alluded to the fact that God has a very specific purpose for his giftings, for these giftings that he, uh, that he has given us. To begin to understand God's purpose in the individual giftings, we've got to understand the exact meaning that Paul is relaying to the church here. What is Paul saying to the church? But to become clear here, to understand clearly what he's saying, we've got to recognize that there is a problem that has plagued the church in this determination for centuries. In the King James Version of verse 12, the verse reads as such. You see it up there. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is what the body is for. I want to show you, though, there's a problem here. There is a dilemma that was created not in the original translation, but in the original translators of the King James Version. This doesn't in any way negate the value of the King James Bible. Please understand, I'm not trying to, to draw it down or to ne negate its value, but I want you to understand that the translators of the King James Version had improperly inserted the comma that comes after the word saints. Now let me explain why. Because in the 3rd century A.D., the Roman Catholic Church had begun to spring up. The New Testament Church, the book of Acts, the first hundred years after Christ, roughly, the church understood, the people of the church understood their duty, their obligation, their role to fulfill these things. For perfecting the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body. But what happened is the Roman Catholic Church in about in the in the third century AD began to dominate. And as they began to dominate, what happened is the, the Roman Catholic Church wanted all duties, all responsibilities to rest upon the leadership of the church. In doing so, they were able to better. Um, control their churches. And so in 1611, when the translators of the King James Version came along, they, these translators were former, former Roman Catholics. And so that idea of Roman Catholicism drifted over into their, uh, their, their putty placement of this comma here, because what it did is it set up that, uh, that, that relationship with how the leadership in the Roman Catholic Church dominated the church itself. And so the problem here was a mindset of the time of 1611. The Roman Catholic Church had determined that all church activity would be carried out by leadership so this carries over into the King James Version. Your modern translators come along, they go back to the Greek, and they realize that while the Greek doesn't really have commas and this type of punctuation, they were able to understand the sense that Paul was making by going back and studying the, the Greek languages, and they understood that the verse should be this, that comma should not be after saints, but rather it should say for the training of the saints in the work of ministry. 
Now, you know as I do, any of you that were raised uh, under King James Bible, which would have been prior to, you know, about 1985 or so, the NIV came out and became very popular in the, in the early to mid-80s. But prior to that, most of us were raised on the King James Bible, and I have absolutely no issues with the King James Bible. You, you almost need a degree in theology to understand some of it, but I have no problem whatsoever with it. The problem was in the placement of this one comma, and the modern translators have realized that. And so, as you see on the screen, the verse actually reads from like the Christian Standard Bible that I use for the training of the saints in the work of ministry. All right, so he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. To do what? To train the saints in the work of the ministry. To do what? To build up the body of Christ. I think it's very important that we understand this, that we have an understanding of this in order that we may have a clear understanding of the Word of God. In this rendering, it's evident that the saints are trained up by those specially gifted individuals, their pastors, their teachers. They're, they're, they're trained up to carry out then the works of the ministry, the ministry giftings that have been placed within them. And with that understanding, we can now arrive at the purpose for these ministry giftings to build up the church, to edify the church, to grow the church, to mature the church. What a great God we serve. Amen? Amen? Church, let me tell you, we're all in this work of ministry together. Amen. Praise God for that. I need you. You need me. We need each other. Amen. I'm going to be talking about unity in the body tonight. We need each other. We need to work together. We need to strive together. We need to, to get in the trenches together. Rather than, than having disunity and disharmony among us, we need to get together and we need to determine that we may have a few differences, but we're going to be okay in and through all of that because we're going to trust God's Word. We're going to live by the Word. We're going to teach the Word. And, and we, may, we may have a few disagreements along the way, but we are not going to allow those disagreements to bring disharmony and disunity to us. Because we've got a much greater mission ahead. And the days are getting shorter and shorter. Jesus is coming back. Each of us, each of you, has at least one specific ministry gift that Jesus Christ has given to you out of His grace. None of us are worthy of the giftings that the Lord gives us. But out of His love for His church, He puts these giftings into us in order that we may fulfill His work here on this earth. Remember Jesus, as he was speaking to his disciples, he said, I've got to go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come and the Holy Spirit enables the word to be spread throughout the world. Jesus could only be one place while he was here in the flesh. He said, I'm going to go away. I'm going to send the comforter. The comforter is going to be there to help you in the perfection of your giftings. To help you, to enable you to fulfill your role in the church. The concept of building up or equipping the body has as its goal what Paul tells us in verse 13. For reaching, and I put there, or attaining unity in the faith, unity in the knowledge of God's Son. With the intent of doing what? Growing into a mature man or woman with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. He's not talking about gray-headed, old, mature. He's talking about mature in the faith. <coughs> mature spiritually. Mature in the Word of God. That is what it's all about here, folks, is you and I growing up. Paul scolded 
attended the church for, for said, you know, you're all still just a bunch of milk drinkers. Said it's time to get into the Word and get the Word into you so you can grow up. It's time to start eating some steak, church. Yeah, yeah I thought that'd get you. <laughs> church, we're all striving together. Common goal here, and that is to assist one another in reaching our full potential as a church in Christ Jesus, growing up to be mature believers in our Lord. The desire of the heart of Jesus for His church is that we would strive together at all times. I'm not talking about only the times that we meet together for church, but I'm talking about all times striving together to carry out His work. The intent of our Lord Jesus is that you and I would grow together in the faith, encouraging one another along the way. I'm sure some of you have needed some encouragement this week. Hopefully there was somebody there to give it to you, to help you out. As we go through our struggles, rather than, rather than downing one another in, in the midst of our struggles, we need to be building up one another. We need to be encouraging one another. We need to be strengthening one another in the faith. Yes. Together, church, God has called us to impact our world. To turn our world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Finally, let me finish up here. It's important that we understand that our giftings are indispensable. Your gift is very vital and important to this church. This church is lacking when anybody is failing to utilize the gifting that the Lord has placed in them. Oh, certainly we'll go along and we'll make it along, but we can be much better the more people are using their giftings. The more we are working together in, within our giftings, the more impact our church can have upon our world. The more beneficial we are to one another, and to a lost and dying world. But when you only have one or two individuals operating in their giftings, the church is almost living in failure. Because we are lacking so much. Church, I want you to understand today you are indispensable to this body. You are a necessary part of this body. God has not brought us together in order to just sit here, folks. God has brought us together to encourage, to build up, to strengthen one another in the faith in order that we may share Jesus around the world. Because of the importance of each of you to the overall functioning of this church body, Paul relegated a great deal of instruction on the subject. Your gifting, folks, every one of you, is indispensable to the proper functioning of this body. I talked about that last Sunday night. Paul relates the human body to the church body. Certainly, I can function if I lose my little finger. But there is some importance to that. And if you lose that little finger, you're going to realize that. Boy, I sure could have used that finger. Oh, yeah, you, you still operate along without it. But God has put this body together just as it needs to be. With all the parts that it needs to function. God puts the, the church body together, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, to function together as a whole. Not to function in disharmony with one another, but to function as a unified whole. With the purpose of going and making disciples. Encouraging one another. Regardless of how insignificant you might personally feel you are or your gifting may be, I can tell you right now that God feels you are extremely important right here. Right where He's put you. You are a vital, extremely important part of what we're doing in this place and what we're doing as a church in our community and the surrounding areas. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through 7, Paul says, There are different gifts, but there's only one Spirit, the same Spirit. Unity. There are different ministries, but there's only that one Lord. There are different activities, 
But the same God is active in everyone and everything. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person, and I like this phrase, to produce what is beneficial. We have been called to produce what is beneficial. In verse 11, we find the Spirit's involvement in spreading out the giftings. He says, but one of the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each one as He wills. You see, it's God's purpose and plan. It's His will that operates in placing the giftings within us. You can't come to me and say, Pastor, would you place a gifting in me? I may be able to help you realize what your gifting is. We can pray together about it. and We can work through some things and possibly perhaps be able to determine what your gifting is. But the giftings come from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the head of the church, as he saw fit to do for the purpose and the plan of this church. Notice that the Spirit is actively involved in the distribution of the giftings, as we've read in this verse. And it is as He wills, as He determines to be best suited for the benefit of the church to fulfill its mission. Verse 18, we find just how indispensable each gifting is to the body. He says, that now God has placed the parts, each one of them in the body, just as He wanted me tell you, you got a specific role in this church. Special gift from God. An indispensable gift from God. That's a very necessary thing in this church. Let me tell you, you were important enough to God to be specifically chosen with your specific gifting to be a part of the mission of this church and the workings of this church. Listen now as I close this morning. Jesus never intended for his church to operate as a spectator sport. That was never the intention of the New Testament church. We were, it was never an armchair sport. We may, we may do that in the world. We may live that way in our, in our lives and in our homes. But I can tell you from the bottom of my heart and from what I read in the scripture, there were never any members in the body of Christ that weren't vital to that body where Jesus placed them. Jesus has a specific design and a pattern for each one of his churches. Because the community we're trying to reach is a different community than First Baptist Harlingen is trying to reach. A different community than First Baptist Brownsville or First Baptist Plano or, or any of these. We are unique here. And God knew what we needed in this church to function in our community. And you're here for a purpose. As a fulfillment of our purpose here as a church. Let me tell you, if you really love your church, it's going to be shown through your desire to seek out what your gifting is. And then to make it a part of the ongoing ministry workings of the church. Your gifting is indispensable. Your gifting is vital to everything that God does. You know, as a part of this church today, it is our responsibility to be fulfilling the work of the Lord. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never surrendered to the Lord. Maybe you've never surrendered your life over to the Lord. Maybe you've sat in a church for years and you have never surrendered your life over to the Lord. You're the reason this church is here. 